Father, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that's here at work, leading us into all truth, convicting us of our sin, confirming and strengthening us in goodness, showing us Jesus, that Jesus, you would lead us to the Father. Speak to our hearts this morning by your word, we pray to the glory of your name. Amen. All right, we're going to look at each of these verses and move through chapter 3, verses 1 to 17 this morning. So it'll be helpful if you have your Bible open in front of you. Uh, There's one under the seat if you don't have one with you. The first question we want to look at in verses 1 to 11 is simply this. What does it mean to be a Christian man or woman? Now, that might seem obvious. Perhaps you've been a Christian for as long as you can remember, but it's something that's worth considering. What does it mean to be a Christian man or woman? Look at verse 1. If then you've been raised with Christ. Well, we're starting to build a bit of a picture here. To be a Christian man or woman means that in one sense, you have truly died. You have died and you've been raised to new life in Christ. And so on the one hand, becoming a Christian may be as simple as saying a prayer, but in the other sense, it's so much more than that, is it not? I could introduce you to countless people who have repeated a prayer, but their lives bear no mark of the cross or of Christ. And so Paul admonishes the Colossians and he says, the Christian person is one who has been raised with Christ implying that there was first a death. He says, If you've been raised with Christ, then seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Verse 2, Set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on this earth. So see, Paul is continuing to build this picture. To be a Christian man or woman means that in one sense, you have died and you've been raised to a new life. Another mark of a Christian man or woman is that Their life is pointed in a particular direction. It's pointed upwards. Did you hear that in verses 1 and 2? Now, in one sense, this could be figuratively that Christians aspire to something greater and something higher and something loftier than just day-to-day mundane, but it's more than that. It means that the Christian person has their eye set on heaven, that they have their eye set on eternity, Verses 5 to 7 says that it's not only that our eyes are pointed upwards towards heaven, but that we are pointed away from, listen to the list. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. So in one sense, if you want to ask the question, what does a Christian person look like? You can look to these outward behaviors. You can recognize them in yourself, and you can recognize them in others. But in a deeper sense, the outer behaviors are not what define a Christian. Look at verses 9 and 10. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have, what does he say? Put off the old self with his practices. And you have put on the new self. Well, there it is. When Paul is defining what a Christian person is to the Colossians, he says it's someone who has put off the old self and put on a new self. That's what defines you as a Christian person. You are no longer the person you used to be. That old person has died. You've been buried with Christ. You've been raised to a new life. That's why Paul says in verse 2, to set your mind on. Verse 5, to put to death. Verse 8, put them all away. Verse 9, put off the old self. Verse 10, Put on the new self. This language of putting off and putting on 
continues all the way through verses 12 to 17. But before we move on, I just want to pause and settle on this for a moment. What does it mean to be a Christian man or woman? Well, in the one sense, it's recognizable through behaviors and through outward traits. If you are a Christian man or woman, it'll be noticeable because outward things about you have changed. But they've changed because there's been a very deep change that's happened in you. You're dead to your old self. You've put it off. You are alive to a new self. You've put that on. What strong language Paul uses here in Colossians chapter 3 to describe the Christian life. This language of putting off and putting on, it sounds almost like clothing, doesn't it? And so I think what Paul's getting at here in these couple of verses when telling us about the Christian life, he's saying that there is both a moment and an ongoing sense to the Christian life. You put off the old self, you die to the old self, you put on a new life that is in Christ, and then you spend the rest of your days growing in that new life and in that new reality. Well, that's what it means to be given a new life, isn't it? If you think about a baby who is born, there is a precise moment in which that baby is born. And they are born with everything they need to then grow into full maturity and full stature. That's the picture that Paul's painting here. He says a Christian is someone who has, in a moment, put off, put on, died to, been alive to, and now grows into this new self. This new self that is yours from God in Jesus Christ. Well, if you look down to verse 11, you'll see that this new self that you're given is not one that's lived out in isolation. Instead, the Christian man or woman lives out their life in a new community. And when Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae, they had um, some particular problems in their church that Paul was addressing pastorally. One of the problems in the Colossian church is made explicit here in verse 11. Look at it. Here, there is no Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but, what does it say? Christ is all and in all. Paul says, in this church in Colossae, there were divisions that were becoming evident. People were um, identifying themselves in different identity groups. See, identity politics is not a new thing. It existed 2,000 years ago. And Paul reminded them, no, no, no. It's all about Jesus. Jesus Christ, period. This new life that you've been given by God in Jesus. You've put off your old self. You've put on a new self. You've died to who you were. You have a new life. That new life happens in community with other Christians. And in that new community, there can be precisely zero divisions. Well, Paul lists these factions within the church in Colossae. And in doing so, what he's really listing are false hopes and idols. He's telling the Colossian church that they have put their hope and trust in people, in things, in places. They have put their hope and confidence for safety and for saving and for security in something other than Jesus Christ. And folks, that's the definition of an idol. Now, the issues of Paul's day in Colossae were the distinctions between some who put their hope in the fact that they were Greek while others put their hope in the fact that they were Jewish, some that they were circumcised, some that they were uncircumcised, and you see the list in front of you, but I just want to touch on these two. 
When Paul says Greeks and exposes that as idolatry, he's talking about a Greek way of thinking or a Greek culture. You see, Greeks back then were people who were in love with the pursuit of philosophy. And so to be someone who identified as a Greek back then was someone who thought that they had it all figured out in terms of how the world works. That was their idolatry. To be a Greek was someone who said, I know how the world works. Through philosophy and erudition. To be a Jew, on the other hand, that was someone who said, I know how God works. I can put God into my neat and tidy little boxes. I know the 613 mitzvot, the 613 things that I have to do. I've got it all figured out. That was their idolatry. Well, the point that Paul is making is, if you put your hope in the fact that you know how the world works, that's an idol. You're a Greek. He says, if you put your hope in the fact that you know how God works and you have them all in neat, tidy little boxes, well, that's your idol. And the problem of idols is that they will always overpromise and underdeliver. They will promise you safety and security. They will promise you hope and salvation, but they will leave you in the lurch holding the bag. False hopes and idols will always prove to be shifting sand and bad places to build your house, your life. He says, circumcised, that's another idol. And here he's saying, people who have put their hope somewhat in their ethnic identity, but let's be more specific, People that Paul's talking to here that claim to be circumcised, Paul's saying, your idolatry is that you're putting your faith and your hope in something that you have done. Circumcision. And then he exposes the flip side of the group, and he says, but there's also those of you who are uncircumcised, right? So if the circumcised are people who put their hope and confidence in their safety and security because they've done something, then the uncircumcised are those who put their faith and hope and confidence and trust in the fact that they have not done something. And he says both are idols. Both will bring division. Both will leave you holding the bag. Okay, folks. Get ready. Buckle up. Here comes the application. Paul is calling out idols in Colossae by exposing people who trust in observing outer practices and presumably looking down their nose at others who don't and even trying to require that other people would do the same things that they've done in an idolatrous way. But in the same breath, he's also calling out and exposing Christians who trust in the very fact that they do not do those same behaviors. Let's press into this. He's built a picture and he said, Christians are people who have put to death, put off the old self. They're alive too, they've put on a new self, and they're growing. They're growing in fellowship and relationship with other Christians. Paul is building his argument and he's saying, the problem when you do that is that false hopes and idols will creep in. Those false hopes and idols will be powerless to save you, and in fact, they will splinter and bring divisions and push you apart. So what would Paul say if he was writing this letter to the church in northeast Burlington in 2022? I think he would identify different false hopes and different idols, wouldn't he? Perhaps verse 11 would read something like this. Here, 
There is no vaccinated or unvaccinated. Here, there is no masked or unmasked. Here, there is no liberal or conservative. Christ is all and in all. Paul says that as Christians, God has given you this new self and that you're no longer defined by your old identity groups. You're not divided by hope or trust in doing anything or in not doing anything. That's what, that's what he's saying, folks. Look, I know my inbox might be full by the time I get home, but I'm just preaching the Bible to you. I'm not making this up. And he says, not here. Here, Christ is all and in all. Now, friends, let me admonish you this morning to make that your personal pledge. To make that your pledge for your family, for this church, and as you move out into society. Christ is all and in all. See, we live in a secular world that polarizes everything into this or that extremes and categories. Then we have secular worldly wisdom that says, you know, if you really want to find truth, well, first you identify the two polarities and you say, well, extremism is bad. The truth must lie in some nuanced approach where the two of them rub up against one another. That's secular wisdom in trying to negotiate polarization and division. But the gospel actually comes along, recognizes both polarities, and says, no, neither. I reject your entire framework. Not this way, not that way, a third way, Jesus Christ. Now, to be sure, it's possible to practice any of these things from conscience without it becoming an idol. For sure, it's possible to reject the practice of any of these things from conscience without it becoming an idol. But as Christians, we have to be vigilant and ruthless with our own hearts. Never allowing those things that we do or don't do to become the anchor of our safety, hope, and security. How will you know if what you're doing or not doing has become an idol? How will you know if it's a false hope? You're looking to it for security. Well, let me, let me present to you at least one possible way. You will know that your practices of conscience have become idolatrous when you see them bringing division. Remember, false hopes and idols will always fail and they will always divide. That's verses 1 to 11. Verse 12. So what does this Christian life look like? Well, if you take stock, you've probably noticed that we are surrounded by divisions, polarizations, fragmentations, everyone sort of hiving off into their tribe and corner. It's happening all in front of us in the world. It's tragically happening in some corners of the church, although I'm thankful that it hasn't really crept in here at St. George's, so God bless you. But tragically, these divisions are also creeping into our families. And friends, this is where the Church of Jesus Christ needs to reclaim its prophetic role of leading. We need to embrace not one extreme, not the other, not some nuanced overlapping in a Venn diagram of both, 
but a third way altogether in the gospel. That's what Jesus meant when he said, you are salt and light. That Christians, together as the church, are salt in the world. We prevent rot and decay. We flavor it in a particular way. We're light that shines in the darkness. We lead the world. The world is reprobate and lost and confused and living under the lies of Satan. It's the church of Jesus Christ that has the gospel. The truth. So we're salt and light. Jesus said the church of Christians is like a city that's on a hill. He said it's like a lamp that no one would ever cover up and put under a bushel, but you'd put it up on a lampstand. You see, as, as Christians and as the church, it's time for us to reclaim our role of leading in society. And verses 12 to 15 describe this with three different words. Bearing, binding, and thankful. We're going to look at each of those three. Just a, a cautionary tale when I'm talking about the Church of Jesus Christ leading society, I'm not talking about placards and protesting and angry. I'm talking about what Jesus said was a little bit of leaven that leavens the entire lump. Individual Christians, households, and churches that are committed to the third way of the gospel. And it just kind of works its way through the entire lump of society. Okay, so three ways that Christians live in community with one another, and in so doing, you ex you're an example that leads the world. You're a picture of this third way of the gospel. In distinction to false hopes and idols, which always divide and always fail, the gospel will always triumph and will never divide. So the first one is bearing. Look at verses 12 to 13. I will start, yeah, start back in verse 12. Remember, what we're doing here is building a picture of the church that leads, okay? That lives out of the gospel and Jesus Christ being all in all. Verse 12, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Verse 13, here's the first word, bearing with one another. And if anyone has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. Well, here in verse 12, Paul is explicitly contrasting what he's exposed and forbidden in verse 11 as false idols with the Christian life, putting on compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Paul says Christians don't hive off into identity groups that are really just false idols and false hopes. Christians put on compassionate hearts. That's what you do. He says, you, verse 13, he says you bear with one another. Now, if you're encountering that admonition, that imperative in verse 13 for the first time, you might think what Paul is saying, he's saying bear with one another. You know, maybe you're thinking he's saying put up with or tolerate one another. But in Greek, the actual word is to stand up straight under. That's what Paul's saying by bearing with one another. Stand up straight under. Precisely what Paul is recognizing is that every relationship comes with a burden or a load. And that the Christian person refuses to be divided from their brother or sister but instead takes that relational load on their own shoulders and stands up under it, joyfully carrying it for the other person. That's what it means. Paul presses further into this image. He says that when you're bearing with one another, he says if anyone has a complaint against one another, forgive one another. That's a picture of bearing with one another forgiving with forgiving each other as the lord has forgiven you you must also forgive see this is this is flushing out this picture of what it means to bear with one another 
It's more than just tolerating. It's more than just putting up with. It's taking the load of the relationship on your own shoulders and standing up straight under it. If you have a wrong or a complaint with a Christian brother, if you have beef, what are you going to do with it? Paul says, no division. You forgive each other. You as a Christian take the weight of that wrong on your own shoulders rather than demanding payment from the other person. You pay the emotional currency necessary to squash the beef. You stand up straight under it. He says, why? Well, because that's what God did for you in Jesus. He bore the burden and the weight of your sin and of your guilt on the cross so that you don't have to bear it and it will never be demanded of you. He said, if you have a, if you have a problem with someone else, um, forgive them by bearing up under it because you've been forgiven in Jesus So the first picture is to bear with others because God and Jesus is born with you. Verse 14. And above all these, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Binding. So bearing and binding. He says, let love bind you together. If you're going to get along in fellowship with others, If you're going to have relationship with other people who are saved and have been born again by the Spirit of God, you are going to have to get along with people who have different ideas than you. You have to get along with people who have different practices, maybe different cultural backgrounds and different experiences, different personalities, different levels of risk tolerance and risk aversion. Different political ideas about how best to create a better society and a better world. You're going to have to get along with them. And the only way that's going to happen is if you love one another. Here's another way to expose false hopes that divide in your own heart and in the church. When you see someone who thinks differently than you, Is your first reaction to love them? If you see someone who has a different conscience than you on best behaviors and practices, do you assume the best about them or the worst? Well, if you assume the worst about them, then you've fallen into the secular narrative. Let's let's make it really pointy. If you see someone who is wearing a mask and you assume that they are a sheep or that they are stupid. If you see someone who's not wearing a mask and you assume that they are selfish or don't care about others. If you hear that someone is double vaxxed with a booster and you assume that they've just not done their research or not, you know, you just assume the worst about them. Or if you see someone who's unvaccinated and assume that they must be an alt-right conspiracy theorist flat earther. Paul says, when you see that in your own heart, repent. Put it off. Put it to death. Get rid of it. Instead, bind together in love. You know, we have a sort of sentimentalized view of love. We talk about it in terms of feelings and emotions. But when the New Testament talks about love, it's very practical and it's very gritty and it's very strong. 1 Corinthians 13, Paul says that real love is patient and kind. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things. It gives the other person the benefit of the doubt. And that kind of love never fails. So Paul's saying, bear with one another, bind together in love, because your brotherhood and sisterhood in Christ calls you into harmony. Verse 14. Listen, folks, here's, if if you could just zoom out on your life, okay? If you could zoom out with the perspective of, of, of hundreds and hundreds of years from now, 
you'd look at it and say, we're all going to spend eternity together anyway. And in that moment, all of those idols and all of those false hopes will all be left behind. So why don't we just live that way now? Reject the narrative. Reject the framework. Reject the binary, either this or that. Reject that polarity and say, no, those things aren't going to matter in eternity. What matters is the third way, the gospel, Jesus Christ. Let that bind you together in love. Seek those things that are above. Those things that are true for all of eternity, seek them now. Reject all other narratives and hopes but Jesus Christ. Bear with one another. Bind together in love. Verse 15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Bear Bind and be thankful. See, when this third way guides your life, Christ is all and all. When that third way rules in your mind and rules in your heart, when you're, you come into Christian community and you walk together as one body, you'll look at others and you'll say, I don't really care if you are this or that. Fill in the blank. I care if you're in Christ. Everything else is peripheral at best, but false hope and dividing in fact. Well, Jesus said in Matthew 10, 28, don't fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Let's care about the things that Jesus cares about. When Jesus Christ is your only hope, not doing or not doing, then you'll be so eternally thankful that peace will govern your heart and you'll be one body with other Christians. Um, We're going to conclude. Let's just gather up all that we've covered in these verses, okay? Paul says that a Christian man or woman is a new self. That they've put to death, they've put off the old, that they've put on the new. That this new self that they live is no longer defined by external hopes or identity groups because those are idols. And that we as Christians are called to lead the world to bearing, binding, and being thankful. And so our concluding thought is verses 16 and 17. How does this happen? How does it happen in the life of the believer and in the life of the church that then radiates out into the rest of the world? Well, it happens in this way, verse 16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach, admonish one another in all wisdom, sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, that was a really, really, really long way all around the mountain to get to the verse that speaks to our series, God's Word Written. But friends, if you want your life to be defined by that simple creed, Christ is all and in all, the only way that happens is by letting the Word of Christ dwell in you more richly than any Twitter feed more richly than any other podcast, more richly than any other news commentator or pundit or editor. When the word of Christ dwells in you richly, Christ will be all and in all.
Let's pray. Father, thank you that in your mercy, in your sovereign grace, you set your affection on us from before the foundation of the world. You purchased our pardon with the death of your son, Jesus. You have caused us to be born again. Lord, if there are areas in our life where we are clinging to false hopes and to false idols and false identities, would you mercifully convict us of those and show them to us that we might repent? Lord, lead us. Lead us individually, lead us in our homes and in our families, lead us as a church that we might lead the world and truly be salt and light a city on a hill, a lamp that's not under a bushel. Give us the wisdom and the strength to reject secular ideas and secular framework and to live only ever out of the gospel. We pray this to the glory of your name. Amen.